If you'd like to mark the song that will be after our lesson, that will be 871. 871. And the song before the lesson will be 268. That was 268. If it's not a burden to you, let's stand as we sing. Please be seated. The scripture reading for today is 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 16. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make the great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able to thus offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you, and sojourners, as all of our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is always your own
Good morning, good morning. What a wonderful day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So thankful that you're all each here this morning. So thankful for our members that are here. So thankful for our visitors as well. I pray that the service is uplifting as well as perhaps even challenging this morning. And that goes both ways to the members and to the visitors alike. Because this morning, as some would say, that this is probably my, my resignation sermon, as some would like to describe, a sermon on giving. As most people say, you can talk about my vices, just don't talk about my wallets. But, nevertheless, I want you to know up at the, the front end of this, I'm going to front load this and say, that this sermon is not directed at your wallet whatsoever. This sermon is squarely directed at your heart. Because that is truly where this subject runs into. That giving has everything to do with the heart and hardly any to do with the wallet. It has to do with where our heart is. And and I want you to know, I've been talking about giving every single Sunday that I've been here. It's never never at the, the back end of the preaching. It's never set off to the side. Actually, I preach on giving every Sunday. Now, it's not only always that of money, but no, it's that of your time, it's that of co- your commitment, and especially any time I talk about giving, it's not just about you. It's most of all about the Heavenly Father. For the Heavenly Father is truly the one who has given first. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so that whoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 3 and in verse 16, Therefore it is absolutely impossible for me to preach to you about the grace of God, the mercy of God, without talking to you about the giving of God. So then, after all that, now we're going to deal with this. We're going to talk about this portion right here. Our giving. And now our giving should not be pushed off to the side. It's not just something that is tacked on to the end of the Lord's Supper. No, it is an act of worship. That just as important as our singing is, so too is our giving. That just as important as the preaching is, so is our giving. It is not something that we can just kind of shy away from. That just in as much as God would be displeased with us, if our heart, our mind, our body and soul is disengaged from the song service, from the sermon, from the Lord's Supper, it is also displeasing to God for your heart, your body, your soul, to be disengaged from giving to the Lord thy God. That this is something of importance. And please do not think that I'm just preaching this because it's how I get a paycheck. That's not the point here. The point here is about giving honor to God. Giving glory to God. And we do that through sacrifice to God. And we see this from the very beginning of the Bible all the way to the very end of the Bible. We see it there instituted in Genesis with Cain and Abel and how they are to give of their first fruits. They are to give of the best of the best. And that God was always concerned with mankind giving back. And mankind has always interpreted this always understood giving as the idea of giving back. Why? Because we always knew, or at least we used to at least, that everything that we have, first and foremost, comes from God. That is why it's called giving back. We're not giving something to God that is not already His own. That it has always been His, it will always be His, and we're just merely giving it back to Him. That He has entrusted it to us like He entrusts stewards. Jesus would talk about this with the the parable of the talents. And as much as the Master is the one with the talents there, and then the Master entrusted it to the differing servants. But then the Master expected what? Return. He expected that. And so too does God expect return for what He has given to us. Please understand that to think that God needs our giving is a complete and utter mistake. God does not need your money. God does not need anything. There's a theological term for this. It's the aseity of God. Meaning that He is completely sufficient in and of Himself and needs no external force for Him to be who He is. Meaning that God's work is not going to be hindered if you don't give. 
God's will is not going to be hindered if you don't give. God's Word is not going to spread if you don't give. No. His work, His will, and His Word will still be accomplished whether you give or not. Why? Because God does not need it. So then the question is then, well, why then do we give? Why, why then do we set aside a portion on the first day of every week to giving back to God? Number one, because it's commanded. Let's just get that out of the way at, at, the, on, at the onset of all of this. Right? Rogers even quoted the Scripture for us and read the Scripture for us there out of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and in verse 2. Saying on the first day of the week, as you gather together, give. Lay by in store each as you prosper. Therefore, it is a responsibility for each and every one of us as we are prospering to be laying in store. Laying aside for the work of God. That's something that we must be doing. So understand it's command, but it's also something that God wants us to be doing. That it's not something God needs, it's something that God wants. And why God wants it is because through giving, we understand His giving. It is through the emulation of what God has done for us do we better understand what God has done for us. We truly understand what it means to sacrifice. We truly understand what it means to trust. It's very important here. I've used the illustration before in the past, I believe. It was probably on a Sunday evening. Whenever I talk about whenever you are trying to teach one of your children how to share and how to be a well-functioning member of society, oftentimes how you begin to teach them how to share is by asking them for something that they love. Asking them for it. To where you ask, let's say I'm asking why. Why I want one of your McDonald's chicken nuggets. What do they do? They look at you like you're insane. How dare you ever ask me to give something that I love? And then you're thinking as the parent there, little child, do you not understand I'm the one who gave you the chicken nuggets in the first place? Do you not understand that I am the one who can provide to you all the chicken nuggets in the world that you could ever hope to eat or take away all the chicken nuggets in the world that you could ever hope to eat? So then why do I ask? Because it's not the chicken nugget that's important. It's that they learn to give that's important. So too with us. How does God look at us whenever the collection plate comes around and we go, whoa, how dare God ask of me to give of my money? How much uh, do we look like little children there throwing a fit? We need to understand it is first and foremost God's. That the whole reason that we have anything at all is because of God. That God has given it all to us. That that should be the thing that undergirds our whole entire understanding and practice of giving. That it is all God's. And the Israelites, they knew this. When we look there at Exodus chapter 19 and in verse 5, God Himself would state this fact at the very end of that verse. He says, for all the earth is mine. It's all mine. It is. And then the Israelites would again begin to preach this message too. There in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and in verse 14, again stating this fact, saying, Behold, for the heaven, for belongs to the Lord is the heaven, and the heaven of heavens in all of the earth that is within. It's all God's. Again, Psalm chapter 24 and verse 1 would again state this fact that the earth belongs to the Lord in all therein. It's all God's. And that's where we have to start here. Because absolutely nothing else here will make sense to us about giving. And about giving back to God without first understanding that it is already all God's. And that we're merely giving back. So let's start there. That it's God's. And we're going to work off that premise for the rest of this sermon right here. So then, I want us to turn in our Bibles and the anchoring passage will be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7 here. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7. Another 
well-known passage to where it says here, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Right here, notice the first thing that we find in this passage. Number one, the comparison. We find this comparison of essentially the two ways that we can give to God. The two ways in which each and every one of us, whenever we put something in the collection plate here this morning, we were on one side of this aisle. Either, as it says in the text, one reaped or sowed sparingly, and then one sowed bountifully. That's the comparison here. So let's begin to look at this lesson here and see what each one of these means. So it first starts out that the way that some gives is sparingly. That some will be giving sparingly. Now to be able to understand this idea here, we have to focus in on the key word, which the key word there is sparing. The sparingly. And we understand this word in our English language. It's used in many scenarios. Think of it that if I'm in a, a part of town that I should not be in, at a, part, at a time I should not be there, and then somebody comes up to me holding a gun, and they say, give me everything you have. To which I say, you can have everything, only spare my life. So what does that mean? It means you can have absolutely everything else except for this right here. It means I'm going to hold something back. You can have everything else but this. In the same way we understand it in the opposite sense, when we say that if somebody is sick and is hurting or in need of financial help, and then you go up to them and say, well, I'm going to spare no expense in helping you. Meaning what? I'm going to hold nothing back. That whatever you ask, whatever you need, I'm going to provide it to you freely and openly. It is the same kind of giving that God gave to us whenever He gave to us Jesus. Romans chapter 8 and in verse 32, for it says there that God was not even willing to spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all. That God was not willing to hold Him back. God was not willing to even spare Him, but rather gave Him freely. So then, when we understand this right here, that the person who's sowing sparingly is trying to hold back. They're, they're giving, but they're not. It's like they have seeds in their hand there and they're trying to cast it with a closed fist. Maybe one or two falls out, but no, the majority of them stay clung to their fist. They're trying to essentially put change into a cup again with a closed hand to where the coins stick to their hands like a, mag like a needle sticks to a magnet. That right there is not how we are to be given. That right there is not how God wants His children to be given to Him. That whenever you sit down the evening before, the week before, the month before, the year before, and decide how you are going to be giving to God, the question is not, how much can I keep? But rather, it should be always, how much can I give? That's the difference. That's the difference between sowing sparingly and sowing bountifully. If we're sitting here of how much can I keep and still be pleasing to God, that right there is the wrong mindset. That is the very heart of Ananias and Sapphira that we find there in Acts chapter 5 and in verse 11. Because again, they were willing to give some to God, but they didn't want to give all to God. They said, I will give to God, but with that closed fist. I will give to God, but sparingly. Brothers and sisters, that's not how we should be. We should trust God with our finances. Because each and every one of us here that have been baptized into Christ and have put on Christ, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, that we trust God for our salvation, why do we not trust God with our finances? That if we trust God that He has prepared for us a heavenly home above, John chapter 14 and verses 1 and 2, why do we not trust God to provide to us an earthly home? It does not make sense. It's the same message that Jesus was preaching there in Matthew chapter 6, really the entirety of the chapter, whenever He's telling us, do not worry about tomorrow. 
Do not worry about your daily bread. Do not worry about your clothing. Do not worry about your shelter. Why? Because God even clothes the sparrows of the field. He takes care of them, and how much more valuable are you than they? Don't sow sparingly. Do not try to give, but hold back. You know, it's one of those little things whenever I'm trying to give Wyatt, let's say, a coin or something to put in his little piggy bank, but then I don't let go of the other end. It's like, did I really give it to him? No. You see, many times the things that we try to hold on to are the things that we lose, but the things that we hold with open hands are the things that we keep. You see, we need to be giving. And this giving here, please don't just think that this should be only applied to your finances. It should be your time, your effort, your energy, your skills, the whole lot of what God has blessed you with, give back to God. Give back to Him. And to say no is to again go against the very fundamental premise of this all, of saying, no, I'm not going to give this to God. Well, it's already God's. So what's the issue here? Again, just always go back to that right there, that it's already God. In the Scripture reading that we had here this morning, whenever David is talking about the building and the collection that was being gathered together, he says that we give to you of your own. It's everything that we have given, it was already yours. That's his understanding, that's the Jewish understanding of this, and that must be our understanding of this as well. So that's the negative side of things, but then the positive side. It says, whoever sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. This word bountifully here can be translated in a plethora of different ways. It can be translated generously with the idea of blessings in mind. And oftentimes, this is the way that we look at it. That we are to be giving generously. Now that right there is a very important point when we consider all of this that we are to be giving generously. Now, how do we do that? That's the question here that we should really seek to uncover. How do we give generously? Because the next verse explains to us how to do this. So it's going to give us the explanation of how to give generously or how to sow bountifully and also how to reap bountifully. And now let me just tell you ahead of time, it's not talking about reaping physical benefits. It's not a prosperity gospel for that is a poisonous gospel. There, there's no such thing as health, wealth, and prosperity found in the gospel of Christ. That's not it. So here, let's look at this point number two, the command. There in verse 7, it starts out and it says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Right here, each one must give. Now, that phrase there, each one, means everyone. Everybody who's in the body of Christ must be giving. That each one, each as they prosper, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and verse 2, must be giving as they prosper. To not do so is to be going against the commandment of God, and therefore, it is sin. We're not going to mince words here. We're not going to pretend like it's not. No, it is. So then... How do we give? So, the point is this. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. And this giving here and the decision of the heart, again, how I said at the very beginning here, that the whole point of the sermon is it's not directed at your wallet, it's directed at your heart. Jesus would teach us there in Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 21 of saying, for where your treasure is, so too is what? Your heart. So again, this is just kind of giving us a road map of where you're at with your heart. So here, he is telling us that we must be giving. Each one, as you prosper, is to be giving to God. And the way that we are to be giving is generously, is bountifully told to us by the verse before. So what does that mean? What does it mean to give generously? Because there are some who say, well, I don't have to give a tithe. Because we're not under the old law, right? For Christ is the end of the law to salvation to everybody who believes, or to righteousness to everybody who believes. Romans chapter 10 and in verse 4. So the old law has been done away with. Therefore, well, 
sweat off my brow. I don't have to give that tithe or that 10% because I'm not under the Levitical system anymore. I'm like, you're right. You're right. You're not under that. You don't have to give the tithe. But guess what? You do have to give generously. Therefore, that means so much more than the tithe. Because understand this. It's writing here to first century Christians, first century Jews within this context here, to where what would they define generous as? Even if you look it up on your phone here, please don't do it now, but do it whenever you get home. If you look up on your phone what generous means, it means to give more than is expected or that of necessary. Give more than that which is expected or that which is necessary. So the Jews, when they would read that they are to be giving generously, they would say, I need to give more than what is expected of me. Well, what was expected of the Jews to give? The tithe. So whenever it says here to give generously, the Jewish mindset would be, I need to be giving more than just that tithe. I need to be giving so much more. So you're right. You're not under the Levitical system anymore, so you don't have to give the tithe. No, you have to give generously. That's the point. Now, for each and every one of us, that generous is going to be different. And we need to understand that as well. I'm not saying that there's a certain percentage that you must hit to be able to get it. It's not, you know, 10.2 or whatever. It's not 11%. It's not 12%. It's not whatever. No. Truly, it's 100%. I'm not saying empty your bank accounts and give it all to the church. No, I'm saying the commandment in the Old Testament and the New Testament that Jesus would repeat of saying this is the greatest commandment is what? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. That word all there is repeated time in and time again. And if it says there, notice it, to love the Lord thy God with all your what? Your heart. Okay? And then Jesus says, for where your treasure is, what, will, what else will be connected with that? Your heart. So when you are loving the Lord thy God with all your heart, yes, that means with all of your treasure. Yes, that means with all of your possessions. That does not mean that you have to go and empty out your whole entire bank account and give it all to the church. That's not it at all. But what is being said here is that everything that you have, everything that you own, should be for the purpose of bringing glory to God. That absolutely everything, providing shelter and security for your family. Why? Because you need to be a good steward of your household. You need to take care of your family all for the purpose of what? Bringing glory to God. Honoring God. That the giving that we are to be doing, yes, it is to be done on the first day of the week, but it is also every single day of the week that we are to be giving to God. That's the point here. It's all of your heart, all of your treasure. So yes, we're not under the tithe. We're not bound to 10%. No, we're bound to 100%. And, and let's, let's start living that way. Because that's what we see there at the early church, there in Acts chapter 4. They had all things in common. They were giving all to each other. Why? Because they trusted in the Lord thy God. Why? Because they loved the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, all of thy soul, all of thy might. This right here is, is the command that has been given. But please understand, it is how it has been decided in your heart. Meaning that each and every one of us make, must make a decision. And this is a decision that has been decided. Past tense, meaning not right now. Right? You can't really decide past tense as the collection plate is in your lap. You're pulling out your wallet. You're grabbing out a buck and throwing it in there. No, that's not decided. That's spontaneous. No, decided is past tense. To where you sat down. You contemplated all the things that God has given to you. And truly, all the things that are already God's. And then you say, I'm going to give back to God of my first fruits. I'm going to give back to God. I have decided this in my heart. And now I'm giving it to God. So that's right there is a task for each and every one of you. Is to look within your heart and decide how much you're willing to give to God. And again, this is not just talking about that of money. This is talking about that of your time, your effort, your energy, your soul, your might, and your heart. It's talking about everything here. And I would encourage you and exhort you to give generously. To give 
bountifully, because there's a promise attached to it, that he who sows bountifully, so too will reap bountifully. So, again, now noticing a little bit more of the words here that are given here of how we are to be giving generously. It says, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Now, these are the two negatives here, and they essentially are talking about sparingly. To give reluctantly is to say, well, I can give a part, but I can't give everything because if I give all that I already said I was going to give and all that I had already said that I had decided in my heart to give and I'm reluctant at giving that, I don't want to give that. No, don't do something that you don't want to do. Don't do something that you're going to regret later because notice the very last part of verse 7, for God loves a cheerful giver. Right? Not a reluctant giver. God does not want you reluctantly to be putting something into the plate out of obligation because God doesn't need your money. First and foremost. Therefore, don't give reluctantly. That's not the point of any of this at all. To where again, reluctantly is, you know, you're holding on to that, that dollar with a tight grip or that coin with a tight grip and you're not letting go of it. That's not the point here. We are not to give reluctantly. We're not to give under compulsion either. Now there might be some thinking, well, I got you, preacher. You you said You're not supposed to give under compulsion, therefore you're not allowed to preach about giving because now I feel compelled to give. Well, you you didn't actually get me, I promise. Because we are commanded to preach about giving. We are commanded to preach about these things. So what's the difference between compulsion and then not? So there's a big difference between compulsion and conviction. That if you're here this morning, and after hearing the message here from God about talking about giving, and you're wanting to give more, and you're thinking to yourself, I should be giving more, or I should start giving, that's not compulsion, no, that's conviction. There's a big difference. Let me, uh, let me further explain this. We're not to be baptized under compulsion. We're not to offer any sort of sacrifice to God under compulsion. Just like a child is not to be baptized because they feel this compulsion to do so because their parents want them to do so. We all understand that's not correct. That's not right. In the same way, a child is not to be baptized whenever their friends all at summer camp are also being baptized. They feel this compulsion. That's not correct. That's not the heart that God wants. But according to Scripture, when you're convicted, you must be baptized. When you're convicted of your sin, when you're convicted of your shortcomings, when you're convicted of who Christ is, you are. And we see that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. They were pricked to the heart, saying, what must we do to be saved? Peter responds, repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins. So there's a big difference, right? Between compulsion and conviction. Each and every one of us must be convicted when giving. If we're not, are we complacent in our giving? Because that's the thing. We must be convicted every time we give. We must truly feel that this is going to the service of God. That this is already God. This is laid inside in store for God. There must be a conviction when we give. Just in as much as when we sing, there's to be a conviction in our hearts. When we read Scripture, there's to be a conviction in our heart. When we listen to the sermon, there's to be a conviction in our heart. When we partake of communion, there's to be a conviction in your heart. When you give, there's to be conviction in your heart. Because without that, are we just sitting here in some sort of stupor? Complacent? That's not how God wants us to be given. Because again, notice the very last part there. For God loves a cheerful giver. Meaning that it's not just something that you do. No, it's something that you get to do. It's something that you want to do. And we as Christians should take full advantage of the opportunity to give back to God. Because this is not something that non-Christians can participate in. They can't give back to God. No, this is something solely given to the church. This is a blessing of being in the body of Christ is to be able to give back to God. So, not under compulsion. So notice the very last point here, the commendation. 
God loves a cheerful giver. And this kind of brings it all to conclusion here. If you're thinking, okay, I understand now how to sow bountifully or sow generously, how then do I reap generously? Or how then do I begin to reap bountifully? Well, this is what you're reaping. You're reaping the commendation of God. You're reaping the love of God. And there is absolutely nothing more valuable than God's love. Than, than God looking at you with favor. Than God looking at you and saying, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we're all seeking after. For inasmuch as we are to be loving God, we also want to be loved by God. And yes, God has a general love for us all, for God to love the world, but also there is this deep, deep love that is talked about here. And we should understand this, especially those who sought the approval of their fathers. Whenever I was a kid and I was told to go out and, and mow and edge the grass, I went out there and I mowed and edged the grass. Why? Because I respected my father. I did all these things for my father. And I knew I wasn't going to earn any money from my dad because allowances were a myth at that point. I, I didn't actually believe in them. So I'd go out there and I'd mow and I'd do that stuff. What was my reward? This. My reward was my father saying, well done. My reward was my father showing me love after the fact. I was willing to give to get that. That was more than any portion of money that I could have ever gotten was my father. In the same way, that is what God is offering to you. God is offering to you that commendation. He's offering that. He says, I love a cheerful giver to be able to be found pleasing, and to be that sweet-smelling aroma to God. That right there should be all the motivation in the world for us to do it. And that's the primary meaning here. But also the secondary and the tertiary meanings of this right here is that when you begin to give to the church, when you begin to give to God, then also spiritual fruit begins to grow. Things begin to happen. We see the works that we are participating in here at East Almeida, whether that's at Bear Valley or that in India, in all the different places around the world that we support, and we can see the spiritual fruit that is being reaped there. Again, it's not talking about we're physically blessed. We did not get a new escalator or anything like that here. That's not the important thing. Souls are important. Souls are what are valuable. And when you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. So then, give. Trust God in this. Trust God. Inasmuch as you trust your salvation in Him, trust Him also in this right here. Because this is what God requires of us. It is a command. It is an imperative. It is not something that we get to opt into or opt out of. It must be done. So do so with the right heart. Decide in your heart this week of how you are going to give to God, yes, of your money, but also, yes, of your time, your effort, your energy, your skills, everything. Because again, we are to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Absolutely everything in its entirety. So then, if you are not a Christian here this morning, understand that God has already given to you. That God's not going to ask you to do something that He Himself first was not willing to do. God has already given to you His Son, John chapter 3 and verse 16, so that when we believe in Him, when we truly put our trust in Him and are born of water and spirit, John chapter 3 and verse 5, then we may be born again so that we can truly see the kingdom of God. For unless you are born of water and spirit, you cannot see the kingdom. So therefore, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. If you are a Christian here this morning, put your trust in in God. God is the one who has given it to you already. Merely give back to Him so that then you might earn that commendation of God. If you have any need this morning, I pray that you would come now while we stand and we sing the invitation song.